the dance of ages. Since the time of the fall, the Harlequins have fought war unending against the thralls of the Chaos Guards. As the fate of the galaxy's younger races has turned its tempestuous course, and ancient foes have risen up from the shadows of myth, the servants of the Laughing God have held true to their purpose. Across countless worlds, in myriad theatres of art and war alike, they have performed their bloody dances and foiled the machinations of chaos at every turn. Still they fight as the darkness gathers and doom approaches, for they know that the stakes have never been higher. Millennium 30, Overtures of Ages, From Light into Darkness In the wake of the fabled war in heaven, the Elder Eye rise to supremacy as the galaxy's foremost race. Empowered by their supreme technology, they enjoy every luxury and pursue every curiosity. It is a golden age, yet as the millennia pass, the magnificence of the Elder Eye Empire gives way to corruption, indolence, and spiritual decay. Pleasure cults spread through their society, and the pantheon of Elder Eye gods is gradually abandoned in favor of personal deification and insane excess. Yet the Elder Eye are not becoming gods. Instead, the Gestalt psychic outpouring from their descent into perverted madness nurtures a new deity in the warp. A Chaos Guard, whose time creeps closer with each new act of debasement and debauchery. Millennium 30 to 32. Bleak Exposition. Loyal Servants. Even as the Elder Eye Empire decays around them, the masks remain true to the teachings of their god. While some lament the death of the old ways, Others revel in mocking the lunacy they see at every turn. The Harlequins continue to perform the ancient dances of their mythic cycles, seeking to remind their people of all that they are throwing away. Many amongst their audiences respond with hostility, and the Harlequins are compelled to become ever more martially skilled in order to defend themselves while performing. In this way, the ritual Siddharth become forever entwined with the Harlequin's dances. The Fall. A disaster millennia in the making strikes at last. Slanesh, she who thirsts, is brought into existence with a hungry howl that obliterates the empire of the Elder Eye. The Chaos God's emergence tears real space asunder and leaves the malignant wound that humanity will come to know as the Eye of Terror. The Elder Eye, meanwhile, are all but annihilated. Yet amongst the far-flung survivors of this great catastrophe are the Harlequins. And hidden within the webway, Sigora laughs on. Taking up arms, the Harlequins vanish into the labyrinth dimension to prepare for the war that will consume their future utterly. Millennium 33 to Millennium 40, Rising Bloodshed. The war begins. After centuries of isolation, Segara's followers return in spectacular fashion. The Mask of the Midnight Sorrow bursts from the webway portal at Leyen Nuada to fall upon a horde of Slaneshi demons. The intervention rescues the embattled war hosts of Craftworld Ulthway, and with their strengths combined, they hurl their demonic foes back into the warp. This is but the first of many such grand entrances, the Grand Masks announcing their return to war with great showmanship. In conflict's wake, as Rubal Vect sees his power in Kormora, few know of his dealings with the Mask of the Veiled Path at this time, or of the dreadful pact he seals with them upon ascending to his throne. The War of Mirrors The Silent Shroud face Wa Gutripper on Sheng's world. Impossibly outnumbered, the Harlequins use the planet's many webway portals to run circles around their orc foes. Only a handful of Harlequins survived the six-month conflict, but they sow such confusion that the war furiously tears itself apart. Rildhull's Salvation The Chaos Warband of Lord Fulgulus attacks the exilite world of Rildhull 
acting at the behest of a shadowy demonic patron. Fulgula systematically poisons the planet's rivers and lakes, and sets a rot fire amidst its forests. His warriors drive back the Saurian cavalry of the local Exodites, and begin a vile ritual within Rildhal's World Spirit Shrine. It is then that the Mask of the Soaring Spite, aided by the witch cult of strife, falls upon the Nurgle worshippers. As the ritual nears its peak, squadrons of jetbikes, grav skimmers, and hellions encircle the Chaos forces, before constricting rapidly like the coils of the Cosmic Serpent. Though the Nurgle worshippers fight to defend their position, they are overrun with blistering speed and their ritual ruined. Fulgurus is the last to fall, pierced with the twin blades known as the Serpent's Fangs. Fall of Pardosos The Dreaming Shadow infiltrate the chronostatic tomb fortress of Nemesor Torlak on Pardosos. By sabotaging the tomb complex's temporal matrices, the Harlequins trigger a singularity cascade that exterminates most of the Necrons before they can awaken. Incensed, Torlak leads his lynch guard to hunt down the intruders, but is caught in an ambush by the mask's death jesters, who gun him down by ricocheting their fire off the shields of his bodyguards. The Cull Imperial forces attempt to plunder forbidden archaeotech on the dying world of Caradox. Several masks of the Midnight Sorrow strike without warning, orchestrating a blistering campaign of hit-and-run attacks against our Explorator dig teams and their guards. Eventually, the terrified humans flee, abandoning their tainted prize without learning the horrors it would have unleashed. Strange Saviors The fortress world of Magnor Prime comes under sustained attack by the Night Lord's heretic Astartes. For weeks, the Astra Militarum defenders are picked apart in terror raids, finding their skinned comrades chained to their defences as dawn breaks each day. The garrison are on the brink of revolt, when the Harlequins of the Veiled Path appear as though from nowhere. Desperate enough to heed the advice of Xenos, the Imperial officers follow the intelligence offered by the Harlequins' shadow seers, deploying their surviving troops to counter enemy attacks before they begin. The war turns as the Night Lords go from ambushers to ambushed, and are forced to fight with increasing savagery to hold their own. After another fortnight of costly violence, the Harlequins enter the fight. Faced by allied human and elder eye forces, the remaining Night Lords melt away into the warp. Magnor Prime is saved, and the Veiled Path leave as mysteriously as they came. Millennium 40 to 41 Tempestuous Climax Giant Slayers Knights of House Terrin claim the maiden world of Velos for the Imperium. In response, the frozen stars deploy swarms of void weavers in the Sadath known as the Giant's Lament. Though the cost is high, the invaders are wiped out. Not a single super heavy war engine making it back to the Imperial landing craft. The Demon's Dance A solitaire dual skull taker. Korn's greatest demonic herald, before the Gate of Souls, mirroring the hatred between Korn and Slaanesh. At the duel's height, the solitaire drops his guard and is slain, an act representative of Slaanesh's utter defeat. The psychic echo of the solitaire's self-sacrifice resonates through the warp, repelling a horde of Slaaneshi demons that were about to breach the Gate of Souls and descend upon craftworld Luganath. A single blade. After his bodyguards are drawn away by a series of diversionary attacks, the Zinchian sorcerer Yelgesir is slain in his inner sanctum by a troop master of the Weeping Dawn. None but the Harlequins know the full ramifications of his demise, but across the galaxy, the fates of three planets are altered for the better. All are worlds where blackstone pylons lurk buried deep beneath the planetary crust. The Last Half The Veiled Path make a surprising offer of aid to defend the Imperial naval base at Wrath against pirates. However, as battle is joined, they turn upon their allies, ending their seemingly unprovoked attack by venting the surviving defenders into space. 
the Mejax Encore. The Dreaming Shadow begin a decade-long campaign against the tomb worlds of Mejax, fighting to stem the rising Necron tide after Craftworld Orthway's failure to do so. The First Sign As the Thousand Sun sorcerer Araman learns the first of several truths that will lead him to an attack upon the Back Library, the first cast of light around Sigora's crystal tome flickers and disappears. Curiosity's Cast Tau Empire explorers board the empty husk of craftworld Xianshar. Just days after their arrival, the Tau are driven off by harlequins of the frozen stars, who surge from the craftworld's webway portals to violently evict the interlopers. The Bloody Punchline The collapse of a Necron Dolmen Gate creates a rent in reality and allows a horde of Quanite demons to spill into the webway. There seems to be nothing that can stop their onrushing mass from crashing into the gates of the Black Library, and quite possibly staving them in. Yet the danger is undone, as the Veiled Path awaken a little-used webway gate, and allow the demons to spell out into the Imperial Fortress world of Magnol Prime. The resultant war rages for over a year, and leads to the mutual destruction of the demonic and imperial forces, ensuring that the Black Library remains undisturbed. A dangerous debt. Led by a conclave of shadow seers, the Midnight Sorrow aid Inquisitor Sophia Villemas in defeating the Alpha Legion on Safe Haven. A massive demonic incursion is prevented, but in the battle's wake, the seers informed Villemas that she now owes them a debt, one they will soon collect. A mysterious victor. A great harlequin wins the Cormorite dance of the blinding blade, fighting with impossible speed and skill. Whispers abound that this shadowy figure, who vanishes soon after his victory, was none other than Sigora himself. The Black Prelude. The Dreaming Shadow bring a warning to the forged world of Noctilus Dega Nox. Disinterested in their cryptic offerings, the tech priests order their Skitari to drive the Harlequins off. Thirteen days later, the Dreaming Shadow return, this time in force. They strike at high-value targets across the planet, overloading the reactors of a Titan Manufactorum, assassinating Archmagos Fabricatus Fogali, and cutting off fuel supplies to several critical munitions Macrofactorums. Shocked and furious, the Magi of Noctilus Dega Nox call for, and receive, massive military assistance from the nearby Imperial worlds. By the time the Imperial response reaches the Forge world, the Harlequins are nowhere to be found. Instead, the Imperial forces are suddenly engaged by an invading fleet of warships identified as belonging to the Oroskar dynasty of Necrons. Twilight falls. In the midst of Craftworld Iandon's most desperate battle for survival, Prince Iriel takes up the cursed spear of Twilight. He is compelled to seize his destiny in this way by a shadow seer of the Veiled Path. The enigmatic seer vanishes soon after. Iandon's fate is sured, and the role of the Veil Walker played to its conclusion. A Promise Kept While battling Tyranids on Deshil, Ultramarine Strike Force Apollon find their senses clouded by visions. The swarm is driven back by spectral figures, even as the Adeptus Astartes slump into unconsciousness. Upon waking, they are horrified to find themselves strapped to the surgical tables of the Homunculi of Komora. Of their captors there is no sign, but the Homunculi croon delightedly over a debt settled in blood. Falshu's Wrath Several masks combine their forces into a grand mask, in order to topple the Echo Spire on the shrine world of Beidras. In the process, they earn the undying enmity of the Space Wars, whose honor is besmirched by this bloody disaster. Sigurd's War Rumors circulate through the disparate branches of Eldrai society as the Harlequins are seen at war in unprecedented numbers. Their recruitment rates rise commensurably and disquiet spreads at the sinister implications of these phenomena. Dark Harvest in a string of bloody battles, the Midnight Sorrow trapped 66 heralds of Slanesh within runic stones. 
and comfortably similar in appearance to Elroy Waystones, each is entrusted to the care of a different troop master. The jewels are worn upon the Harlequin's breast, as though to mock the spirit stone of their craft world kin, though the purpose of this shocking practice remains unclear. Bloodied Shards Amidst the crystalline deserts of Chai Halea, the Mask of the Veiled Path meets a vast, cornate warband in battle. Using illusion and guile, the outnumbered Harlequins lead their rage-blinded foes into the shattered rift, before crushing them in a razor-edged landslide. The Seeker Denied Led by the Dance Without End and the Silent Shroud, a grand masked coalition battles to stop Araman entering the Black Library. They are aided by warriors of Craftworld Ulthway and Luganath. The Death of Duriel The maiden world of Duriel, conquered long ago by the Imperium, faces invasion by splinters of high fleets Leviathan and Kraken. To prevent the swarms combining their strength, a band of Harlequins brokers an alliance between Craftworld's Beartan and Iandan, along with the Dukari of Cormorah. The ensuing war is fought on a truly apocalyptic scale that sees the planet itself annihilated in the name of victory. This war is the final sign. Deep within the Black Library, the crystal tome of Segara falls open at last. Storm winds rise. The galaxy burns, the fires of war lighting a bloody stage. As the Harlequins begin to follow the steps of the final act, they are led in their interstellar dance by their shadow seers and by the players of the twilight. A time of changing fates looms as the storm gathers and the mantle of the Veil Walker is taken up once again, the better to direct humanity onto the path that they must follow. Within the Black Library, the maze of whispers and other obscure webway fastnesses, masks gather in readiness. More are seen abroad the craft worlds, amidst the spires of Cormorah and amongst the forests of the Exodite worlds, performing their altered tale of the fall and prophesying the coming of the Ranadandra. Dark times approach, it is said, and the servants of the Laughing God are their harbingers, but also an embodiment of hope that they might be endured. Millennium 41 Dark Denouement The Sundered Path as the fury of the Great Rift tears its way across the galaxy, its shock waves batter the elegant spars of the webway. Rune sealed gates overload, imploding to leave screaming rents that empty straight into the madness of the warp. Webway gates are forced open, leaving the way clear for any malign entity to invade or spin out from the labyrinth dimension. Subrealms collapse and webway spars tear loose and by the time the initial onslaught subsides, extensive damage has been done from one end of the galaxy to the other. Monsters in the Dark Behind the veil of the Noctis at Turner, the solitaire known as the Spectre of Despair stalks Imperial Governor Silas Gorondine. No explanation is offered for the solitaire's murderous mission, and neither reason nor force can stay its pursuit. Trapped within the Nykos system by the lack of warp travel, Governor Gorondine flees from one world to the next, expending entire regiments of bodyguards. The Spectre of Despair cuts a red path through them all. Finally, run to ground within his fortress palace on Nykos Secundus, the Governor abuses his authority to leverage the deployment of an Eversaw assassin against the Solitaire. The two ghoulish figures engage in a blisteringly swift battle across the battlements of the Governor's Palace. Dozens of palace guards are butchered simply for stepping into the path of the ferocious combatants, and the solitaire is sorely wounded over and again. Yet at last, he lures his berserk assailant into the Governor's Sanctum before dealing the assassin a fatal blow. The resultant bioplasmic meltdown obliterates the Eversaw, the Solitaire, and the hapless Governor Gorondine in a searing blast. Creeping Shards Guided by dissonant harmonies only they can hear, the Dance Without End locate a series of webway spars succumbing to demonic infestation. 
Via shattered rune gate, the crystal labyrinth of Zinch is taking over the tunnels like frost creeping slowly across a pane of glass. Taunted by the reflections of demons visible within the crystalline shards, the Harlequins begin a slow and somber dance that winds gradually down until they fall one by one into slumber. Projecting their dreaming cells through the surface of the twisted mirrors, they take the fight to the invaders within their own domain. Sigara's Fist Several masks of the Shattered Mirage begin a campaign of violence against the heretic Astartes of the Red Corsairs. Their target is an ancient and terrifying Blackstone Fortress that lurks upon the fringes of the Maelstrom. The Harlequins launch a series of blistering raids, bursting from the Wedway Gate of the Fortress's heart to surprise the garrisoning force of Red Corsairs. With them come a rogue faction of Asuyani from Craftworld, Ymailoc, who seek to aid the Harlequins in the capture and control of this ancient talisman of Val. A Pantheon Reborn The great unclean one known as Rotigus rambles from one maiden world to the next upon the eastern fringe. He brings with him the deluge of Nurgle. The brackish waters and slimy effluvia of this storm rot the forests, and raise gelid floodwaters to drown wildlife already stricken by a foul and mutating curse of fecundity. On each world so beset, masks of the frozen stars appear. Fighting their way to the site of the planet's world spirit shrines, they perform dances of such startling beauty that all who see them are moved to floods of tears. Even as the elder I weep, so the rains falling from the skies transform from diseased filth to cleansing waters that glow like moonlight. Wherever these purifying monsoons sweep across the landscape, the power of Nurgle is undone, and the corruption reversed. Rumour spreads through the Exodite tribes, though the frozen stars seek more than just to defeat Rotigus's foul plans. It is whispered that if enough Eldorai weep for the corruption of their maiden worlds, their combined sorrow may somehow release the goddess Isha from her imprisonment within Nurgle's fetid manse. Whether such a thing is even possible, none can say. But with Segora's continued survival, and the slow awakening of Inyad still ongoing, some amongst the elder I dare to hope that they may know a pantheon again before the Ranadandra ends. Inyad's Mask Several prominent masks introduce the character of Inyad into their dances. Most portray the god as a character of the twilight. Though dependent upon the mask in question, he is cast as a savior, a liar, or even, in the case of the Mask of the Frozen Stars, a fool and a time waster. All of these dances lead to the creation of the new Siddharth that allows the Harlequins to incorporate their forces with any Yanari they fight alongside. The Mocker's War Isolated by warp storms, explorator fleet Al Om Seven puts down upon a nameless world covered in ghostly ruins. There they are ambushed by the Reaper's mirth. The Death Jesters accompanying the mask engage in a cruel contest to inflict the most ironic demise they can, culminating in an act of sabotage that sees 500 Sigatari crushed together in an instant by the collapse of a depolarized void shield generator. A muse is made. Kane's Gate, a dam against the warp at the heart of Cormora, bursts open, allowing demonic forces to flood through the dark city. During the furious fighting to drive the demons back into the Immaterium, Astubal Vect is undone. Having sent his elite incubi to join the offensive against the foe, Vect is hacked apart by hissing mandrakes in his sanctum. Cabalites in unmarked raiders strike at every safe hold within which Vect has concealed some fragment of himself for regenerative purposes. Some whisper that this coup is the work of Lady Malus, but the Archon herself remains icily aloof. The Veiled Path stage awake unlike any other for Vect, those loyal to the former overlord attend, as do many who hated him and wish only to gloat before going to war for his crown. Only Lady Malus fails to appear. By the time her absence raises alarms, it is too late. 
in the midst of their performance, the Harlequins saturate the wake with potent airborne hallucinogens and unleash their fury on the reeling Archons. Carnage erupts as the exits to the Grand Hall vanish as though they had never been, and ally and enemy alike are murdered without mercy. Vect himself rises from a column of dark energy to preside over the slaughter, very much alive, and declaring himself a living dark muse. In the aftermath of the massacre, shock waves roll out through Cormorite society. Vect's position is rendered nigh unassailable, and only those Archons who had sworn suitable pacts of loyalty to him are regenerated on his command. Most of them, at any rate. As for the Veiled Path, they vanish into the webway, leaving the Supreme Overlord of Cormora firmly in their debt. Unity through blood. Following the fracture of Bealtan, many of its now fleet-born elements clash angrily over the direction that their people should take. The fires of their military might remain undimmed, but a very real danger looms that the shattered craft world's disparate factions may turn their fire upon one another. Disaster is averted when the frozen stars travel from one warship to the next, warning of a demonic threat to the exodite worlds known as the Three Sisters. They whip the Azuyani into a xenophobic fury at the human cult whose rituals allow the demons' passage into real space. The Holocons fight alongside their elder eyed brother in the purges that follow, first upon the Three Sisters and then upon the hive world of Khazar, where the players present themselves as allies to the Imperial forces before contriving to bring down their capital city's void shields just before the sword wind strikes. The Dance of the Great Falcon The Imperial Agri world of Methuselax is overrun by a splinter fleet of High Fleet Hydra. Vast eater swarms sweep over the planet's macro herds and crop continents, replicating ceaselessly until an undulating sea of rippers covers much of the planet. This chitinous living ocean rests spilling through the webway gate concealed at Methuselax's southern pole. And so, a number of masks of the Soaring Spite lead a coalition of Samhan Azuyani, a witch called Dukari, to destroy the threat. Unable to land upon ground swarming with tyrannid organisms, the Elder Eye instead remain airborne. They skim above the fanged ocean, launching pinpoint strikes against synaptic node beasts and engaging in ferocious airborne duels with the tyrannid's winged abominations. Jet bikes and sleek fighter craft weave between bloated living air mines. Troops of harlequins leap from star weavers onto the carapaces of factory sized brood beasts sowing plasma charges to crack them open before leaping back aboard their craft. Casualties are high. Rippers surge upwards in tidal waves and seething spouts of chitin and claws, dragging the Elder Eye down to be instantly devoured. Winged monsters blast aircraft from the skies, sending them spiraling down to be gnawed apart in seconds. Yet in the end, the war becomes so costly and the yield of biomass so meager that the Hive ships dissolve their remaining invasion forces and drift away into the void, leaving a dead world and a safe webway gate in their wake. The Siege of Terror Garas, a sorcerer of the heretical Iron Warriors, raises a mighty fastness, the Indomitasmium, on the death world of Tauros, directly in the flight path of Trife world Iandon. Though constructed unopposed, any iron warriors that emerge from the fortress are set upon by the mask of the Silver Shroud, their voices stolen from them just moments before their lives are ended. Realizing that he is besieged, Garros arrogantly digs in, mocking his lightly armed foe's ability to overcome his fortress. Yet chamber by chamber, corridor by corridor, an eerie pile of silence begins to fall across the Indomitasmium. Those caught in the zones of dread silence for too long find their senses fading until they are rendered deaf, blind, and dumb. Weeks pass, and still the Harlequins strike down every iron warrior that dares emerge, accepting painful losses in order to maintain their strange siege. 
eventually, with his cultists driven mad with terror and his elite iron warriors dwindling, Garrus launches a furious breakout attempt. The sheer grim ferocity of the attack sets the silent shroud reading, yet at the battle's height the shadow seer steals the words of Garrus's summoning ritual from his lips as he is about to complete it. Robbed of their impregnable fortress and their demonic allies both, and with a sense stealing miasma spreading through their ranks, the Iron Warriors dig in for a last stand just a mile short of their extraction craft. But the Silent Shroud do not attack. Instead, as quietly as they came, they vanish. Garros is given just long enough to feel a spark of hope for his survival, before lights in the sky announce the arrival of the Asuyani of Iandon. The battle that follows is as short as it is one-sided.